My name is Matt. I work at Librato. I work on a product called Metrics, uh, which some of you guys may have seen. And I'm going to talk about active support notifications. So um, active support is one of the many kind of core modules that bundle together to make Rails. Um, so this is <coughs> kind of a utility sub-module that's available if you're using Rails. Um, if you're using Ruby and you're not using Rails, it's actually something you can use outside of Rails as well. Um, and it gives you kind of an awesome uh, system for instrumenting events and passing things on to, to your monitoring system. So <coughs> to get into it, I mean, basically what Active Support Notifications is, is it's a publish uh, subscriber system that's built into, into Rails. So there's two kind of core concepts. There's subscribers and there's instrumentation. So the way that subscribers work is they say, I'm interested in any message that gets sent through this system that has a certain message name. And then basically, so you set all those up in advance. And then whenever you send an instrumentation event, you're going to send that with the message name. And any subscribers that have signed up to be interested in that information are going to get the payload from those instrumentation events. So why is this important? I think. <coughs> Right now, a lot of us in our applications have pretty ad hoc ways of capturing monitoring information, or maybe we're not capturing any monitoring information, or maybe we're capturing limited monitoring information. Um, and this gives us kind of a flexible way to take all of that, move it out of our primary application code, um, and one, capture it simply, two, kind of abstract it, and then three, a lot of the performance information you may be interested in, Rails is already actually tracking on itself. So some of that stuff you can just tie into. You may actually be doing sort of redundant performance monitoring um, that you don't need to do. <clears throat> so an important point here is, you know, obviously there's a significant difference between our production and de uh, development environments. So one thing that um, I know, you know, I, I don't know what the what the range is in terms of. Can I just see sort of like a raise of hands for who's already doing significant monitoring on their application? Like, who's looking at real-time data for their stuff right now? OK. And who is like not doing any monitoring on their application? They're just like, OK. So the guys in the middle, do you kind of look at stuff after the fact? Or what, what are you using, just so I have a sense of where you're at? Is everyone doing some kind of monitoring? OK, I'm sure people are not going to put their hands up for that one. But OK, anyway, the point is, yeah, the point is, uh, you know, it, it's important that we have really accurate information for what's going on in production. And <clears throat> well, I think, um, you know, with, with a lot of older systems, there was this notion that collecting that information could be slow, could interfere with request times. Now we have a lot of awesome tools that allow us to do that with really pretty much a zero collection cost. So, that's, that's kind of tied in here. You know, whenever we have an adverse event that happens with our system, everything's trucking along fine, and then all of a sudden, say, uh, the speed of our request slows down a whole lot, we want to be able to look at that and respond to it and have the information that uh, we don't have to go shelling into a box or doing whatever it is that we do to explore. We've kind of already got the metrics for the areas that tend to be hot zones captured. So this is a tool to, to really allow you to do that. So as I mentioned before, there's sort of two core concepts, setting up subscribers and then sending instrument messages to those subscribers. And the way that instrumentation works, you've got the message name, and then you can pass anything else you want as extra arguments after that. And those extra arguments are going to come together, and they're basically going to be the payload that subscribers receive. So <clears throat> there's a lot of flexibility in terms of what you can pass there. Um, and this is an example of what the actual payload is going to come through as. So you've got the message name. You've got a start time and an end time, which for a simple instrumentation like this, those two times are actually going to be the same. But you'll see in a minute how they can be different. And then a, uh, the fourth argument is actually a unique kind of transaction ID the system uses internally. For the most part, you can ignore that. And the fifth argument is really kind of the money one, right? That's the payload. That's all the stuff we've passed to this event. And all of the subscribers are going to get a copy of that. Um, <clears throat> so the other thing you can do is you can actually use a block form of this. And what it's going to do is time execution for you for any code that happens inside the block. So you have the same payload, but there's going to be a difference between your start and end time. Using that, you can calculate the duration of how long it took for that code to actually run. Um, and another thing that's kind of nice about this block form is if you have any exceptions that happen inside the block, you're going to get those as part of your payload, too. So there's an extra argument here that comes through. 
One kind of important point on this is you don't actually get the exception object. So some systems will let you uh, kind of tack other properties onto the exception object. Basically, what you're going to get is the exception name and the message, and that's it. But this is really handy to tell you know, if, if a problem happened during execution of this code. If you've got areas where you're more concerned about or you, know, you want to do general exception logging, it's super easy with this. So on the other end, now we're receiving the payload. What's that going to look like? Well, as I mentioned, um, we get the start and the end time. Calculating duration is pretty straightforward. Generally, you know, you're going to want to multiply the difference by 1,000 because everything you're going to want to track is going to be in milliseconds, and you're just going to get um, <coughs> seconds by default. Um, there's, another, there's another option here, which is there's bundled into active support notifications an event kind of helper class. And if you pass the arguments of what you get in any subscriber to that event class, what you're going to get is basically just a, an object that gives you accessors to all the information that was available in the arguments. One nice thing about this is it does calculate the duration for you automatically. And that's not a super, super big deal. That's obviously something you can do yourself. But if you end up writing a whole lot of these, which hopefully you will if you're using this, it, it becomes a pain to do this frequently. And this is kind of a nice convenience. There's a couple other things the event class can do. like you can, it can actually determine whether another event occurred inside of it and some, some other sort of fancy stuff like that. But um, it's, it's just basically a, mostly a fairly straightforward helper. Um, <clears throat> another thing you can do is instead of saying, I want a certain message name, you can use a regular expression. And so that kind of gives you a chance to capture a bunch of messages that may be in the same class that you want to treat uh, similarly. So I said there's a whole bunch of stuff that Rails gives you for free if you are using this with Rails. So Rails actually uses this super extensively internally. All of the log files that Rails generates, all that information comes from the instrumentation happening and then subscribers that are built into Rails. So what's, what's in there? Well, Action Controller has stuff around processing every action, all the performance metrics for that, sending files, streaming files, um, <coughs> redirections. Um, things like that. There's also some subsets for different kinds of caching that are available. Um, and then Action Mailer, you've got stuff for delivering and receiving mail. Um, you've got the stuff in Active Support that's kind of the base level cache. If you ever use cache, the cache object of your application directly, there's events around all of that. Um, there's stuff around Action View for rendering. And then there's Active Record only has one event that it uses, but it uses it for every SQL query. So, if you're interested in doing uh, SQL statistics um, and monitoring on that stuff, there's a lot that you can do with that. It's pretty flexible. So one thing I just want to point out here is, I, mean, I think in the monitoring world, it's pretty common that you know do a lot of dot decimal notation. Um, with Graphite, it kind of breaks those things down into a hierarchy. Rails is a little funky because all of their built-in events are namespaced right to left. So just kind of keep that in mind. You can, when you're using this for your own purposes, you can do it either way you want, but Rails, they're all, they're all sequenced that way. Um, OK, so what can we actually do with this? So if we're looking at performance monitoring, there's one thing here, process action. Can you guys see this OK? I know it's kind of OK. So there's one particular message, process action action controller, which is really, really pretty money. And basically, through the payload, you're going to get the controller, the action, the uh, format of the request that came through, what status code you're returning. Um, the duration, which is going to be the total time involved in serving the request, but also breakouts for how much time did it take for you to do your database processing, how much time did it take for you to do your view processing. Um, and so, I mean, that's a fair amount of data. The awesome thing is, I mean, you can take just that in general use, and you can do a lot of interesting things with it. So um, this is a graph of <coughs> general request time. The blue line is total request time. The orange line is... Uh, view time and the green green is database time. So, you know, looking at something like this, you can figure out pretty quickly. Okay, there's some some times when this application is spending a lot of time doing um, view view related work. You know, in general, there's no big spikes in the database, so probably we're doing okay in that area. We've got some big spaces in here that aren't either of those things. So, what else is going on, right? Well, maybe this application is talking to some third-party services. Maybe it's doing something else internally that happens outside of the scope of what Rails considers when it's doing that benchmarking. Um, you can do things like, you know, if you attach a source to this, look at how requests are being uh, addressed between different servers. So if this is behind your load balancer, you see something like this. 
you know, why is it that that one machine is, is serving a lot more of the requests? Is that because you've got something going on with, you know, stickiness of sessions and you have someone who's a much bigger consumer? Or is that because you have load balancer problems? That's something worth investigating, right? Another thing you can do is assign some kind of arbitrary threshold, in this case 200 milliseconds, for what you consider a slow request. So you can track those independently. This is basically total requests and slow requests together with that. And this is the same concept, but um, <clears throat> with a little bit of time variation on it. So what's the slowest request within a certain measurement period that's being uh, delivered by each server? So kind of help you find problematic areas in your, uh, in your infrastructure. You know, if we're using cloud-based deployment, not all nodes are equal. Sometimes come up and you have problems with one. So this kind of graph can be really helpful for visualizing that. Um, you also, since you have the ability to capture exceptions from this action, um, you can look at status codes and you can look at exceptions raised and get you know, error counts, simple error counts and more complicated error counts for what's going on in your application pretty easily. So all of that is stuff that you can pretty much get in just a few lines of code with one subscriber for stuff that Rails is already instrumenting. Um, so let's look at SQL monitoring. I mentioned before that there's a, a message that gets sent every time any query happens. This is it. And basically what you're going to get in the payload is the query itself, um, bind variables if your database uses them, and uh, the payload name. So the name thing is kind of a little bit funky. It's something that Rails uses internally. Then it's actually something that if you've ever looked at development logs, and this may be kind of hard to see, but um, at the beginning here of queries, there are certain query types that Rails will attach a name to. The thing that's kind of interesting about this is um, selects that have to do with a model will get attached to that model name. So most selects for, in this case, a partner model will have the name of partner load. So this gives you the ability to actually infer from what's coming through the system kind of what pieces, what components of the system the query is actually related to. So you can use that with conditional stuff to do some pretty interesting things. Um, so here's some examples, again, of what you could do with um, pretty simple, you know, two-line kind of reporting on this stuff. This is uh, SQL queries by instance. Obviously, if you see something like this, you've got to wonder what's going on. Is that a the function of more requests being served? Is that a function of a problem with a specific node? But you can also do things like this, right? So you can say, oh, well, you know, let's not just look at it in a, in a gross sense. Let's look at what our actual queries are. Where are we spending all of our time? Um, there's a lot of great things about Rails. Um, and I think there's a lot of great things about a lot of ORMs and, and web development tools uh, in general now in terms of how they abstract the database. But one thing that can definitely be a problem is a lot of times we build things in a method that's convenient and may not have that much visibility into what we're actually doing, right? So in this case, you know, there's something that we can cache. There's a model that we don't actually need to be looking up all the time, and that's something we can just completely eliminate from the volume that we're, we're doing with our database. <clears throat> so. Without all of this sort of monitoring, you know, I feel like you're kind of in this position, you know? People are, hey, how's it going? Oh, yeah, everything is cool. Yeah, you know, you're putting out a fire here and you're stomping on it, you know? Getting ready to throw, throw your bomb or whatever. But once you've got all your monitoring set up, it's more like this, you know? If you've, you look at your dashboards, and as long as nothing is on fire, just code harder, you know? Plug away at that stuff. And, uh, I think, you know, since we are a metrics company and we are a monitoring company, this is something that we really, we really dog food really hardcore internally. I mean, we're looking constantly at instrumenting different things that relate to our service and, you know, what's the impact of that doing continuous deployment. I think these are really, really, um, I mean, that, that, the ability to do that is a powerful thing. And I think the great thing about active support notifications is it just makes doing that pretty trivial. So how do you, once you've figured out what data you want to capture, you know, you can write your own instruments, uh, instrumentation, or you can subscribe to the existing stuff. How do you actually put it into a system so you can track it and know what's going on all the time? Well, there's a few different things you can do. Um, so one is you can just write extra stuff to your log file. Um, there's some pretty cool services uh, like Paper Trail. Um, you know, you can, so if, if you're managing your log files independently, you can parse through them, create event data from that, report on that. One really nice thing about what Paper Trail does is it'll let you tie webhooks to general events in your log files, so then you can turn around and push those into another system for storing your, your metrics or, uh, or alerts, that kind of thing. 
Um, so there's stuff like our service. I mean, I think in a, in a lot of ways, we occupy a similar space to what people are doing with Graphite internally. Um, there, are d there are definitely some differences in terms of our approach, but here's an example of you know, how, much, how much effort is required to set up something that's going to send, in this case, an increment for the number of signups and track the amount of time that was involved in serving this, this particular request via StatsD to our service, right? So once you have the basics set up, doing more instrumentation is super, super simple. Um, and StatsD, does everybody know what StatsD is? Are you familiar with it in general? Okay, so StatsD is something that came out of um, the Etsy team. Basically, it's a really lightweight node-based tool that you can run and just throw UDP packets at uh, for what's going on in your environment. So the really nice thing about this is you can do that in the middle of a request, and since you're not waiting for a response, it's super, super fast. Since it is UDP, you have to worry about um, issues with packet loss potentially, uh, but there's some really good ways to work around that. Um, and if you're interested in that, come talk to me later. Um, <clears throat> so another thing you can do actually is not do any reporting at all on a subscriber, but use it to aggregate data. So this is something that is actually inside of uh, Rails, inside of Active Record. One of the new features that came out recently is if you're in development mode and a SQL query takes too long, it will actually auto-explain it into the logs for you. And it does that not just based on a single query, it does it based on a set of queries that are involved in a transaction. And this is how it does it. So basically, any query that takes beyond a certain amount of time, it subscribes to that, tosses it into a hash that it carries around in that thread, and then at the end of that processing, it basically runs explain on everything that it's stashed. So this is a pretty general kind of concept that I think could be really powerful because you can say, Here's something that may happen multiple times in my request, and I want to be able to aggregate that. Or here's something that has different facets, and I want to be able to contain all of that and, and report on it in some comprehensive way. <clears throat> so there's a lot of other things you can send your data to. Um, KISS metrics is great. Um, New Relic supports custom metrics. You, know, you can do stuff with Google, Google Analytics and their events and their, uh, their pipelines and stuff. Um, we do quite a bit with campfire and active alerts and in, into our company chat. Um, you can also schedule you know, stuff like background jobs or fire off webhooks. The one thing you need to think about if, you, you know, if you're writing a subscriber that is going to interact with an external services, there is a performance impact. So basically the code that you're executing inside of an instrumentation block is all going to run. And then when that instrumentation block is done, within the same thread, all of the subscribers are going to run serially. So you want them to be super fast. So if you're doing something that involves a webhook, if you're doing something that tosses something in campfire or talks to a service and you need to make sure that the data gets there, do that as part of a background job. There is another possibility you can look at, which is actually the entire dispatching system of active support notifications is pluggable. So if you wanted to, you could implement your own queuing system that does everything asynchronously. Um, but I think the, the simple path for most people is background the stuff that's slower. Um, and you can just set up that, that queuing within the subscriber instead of doing the actual work. I just want to mention this briefly. So it is possible to unsubscribe a subscriber that you've set up. In general, don't do this unless you know what you're doing. Um, basically, active support notifications uses a caching system inside so that once it's seen a message name once, it knows exactly where to send it and it doesn't do any extra work. Whenever you start mucking with setting up subscribers or unsubscribing subscribers, it invalidates all of that cache. So ideally, you want to have all your subscribers established really early in the cycle of your application starting up. So I think like initializers are a great place to put them, or you know, whatever the equivalent is in your Sinatra app or whatever else you're, you're working with. Um, and then generally, you want to not mess with them. So this does exist. If you're interested, I can tell you all the nasty details and what you can do with it. But in general, I would just avoid it. So, that's sort of the basics of how this works. Does anybody have any questions so far? And I'm kind of running through it. No? Everyone is following me 100%. You all know everything now, right? OK, awesome. All right, so shall we proceed to the power moves then? Yeah? All right. You know, like the nunchuck skills, the skin diving skills, right? So one thing that 
I've seen people want to use unsubscribe for is they say, well, I don't want to report on this event all the time. I want to only report in certain cases, right? So you can do conditional stuff within a subscriber. One thing we're a big fan of is the rollout gem uh, by James Golick. We use this to feature flag stuff as we're rolling it out in production. So we can roll out a version of a new feature where we're the only ones that can see it, test it in production, you know, slowly roll it out to other users. And you can actually use this for your instrumentation as well. So let's say somebody has a problem with your API and you want to log something. So I mean, in our case, our API takes some very big payloads. It's completely unreasonable for us to hang on to those for everyone all the time in case we want to inspect them. But let's say somebody comes to you with a problem or you become aware that their account is having a problem and you want to be able to dive deeper, right? Well, you can set it up to use a system like this for doing conditional logging for a user too. Um, so in this case, basically what this feature Active Helper is doing is it's using rollout behind the scenes to feature flag more deep instrumentation for this user. Um, the reason that I use a wrapper for this is that uh, the rollout gem actually won't capture things like connection failures and stuff like that. Um, so it's important to kind of wrap and do error handling for that. But this is a really powerful technique. Um, and actually, one of the things that we do a lot is kick off um, our, our ops and our uh, control what's going on with our application via Campfire. So this is Tweaky. This is a Campfire bot that was written uh, that's Ruby-based and event machine-based by uh, one of the guys on our team. It's open source. You can check it out. Um, and we'll use it for stuff like this, right? So hey, this customer, in this case, Travis, who's one of our customers, they're having a problem. Let's turn this feature on, right? And then after we've worked through, we've seen what's going on with them, we can turn it off again super easy. So tying these techniques together, it becomes really powerful. Um, another thing you may have noticed is that I have a lot of slides that say active support notifications somewhere in the code. And you know, for a simple example, it's great to be specific, but once you get into instrumenting things all over the place, it gets super, super repetitive. So this is Ruby, right? We've got the standard library. We can forward our instrument method across all controllers. It's trivial. Um, you can use the same kind of approach in a module um, for things like your models. Um, <clears throat> but just remember that you, know, you, don't, you don't necessarily have to get tied into referencing the constant everywhere. Another place where this can get super repetitive, and actually I was just working on a case of this earlier today is with your subscribers. So you may set up a whole bunch of subscribers. They're all sitting in one file. And you know, active support notifications subscribe over and over and over again. Well, the Rails team had the same problem. And basically, their solution for this is log subscribers. So this is a separate piece of active support. It's not actually part of active support notifications. But what it allows you to do, if you look at the bottom here, is you basically can create a class and then attach it to a namespace. And then each method within the class will uh, be called when the method name, <laughs> when the right method comes through. So in this case, the namespace is user, right? And if you get a sign up user message, then the sign up method is going to be called. So this is a way to sort of consolidate those things down. If you look at the, the way that these messages are handled internally in Rails, they use log subscribers all over the place. So, Essentially, what this is doing is it's just stacking a bunch of subscribers within one namespace together. <clears throat> OK, so I mentioned earlier that uh, you can use this outside of Rails, and you can. There's no need to require all of active support. You can basically use this completely standalone. Um, the only thing that it needs is secure random from the standard library, which it uses to calculate its transaction IDs, its unique transaction IDs. Um, so definitely use it outside of Rails. Um, and if you want to use the log subscriber kind of nice feature, that's something that you can require separately, because as I said, it's separate. So here's some examples. <clears throat> this is from uh, Faraday Middleware, which is a library that uh, Wynn Netherlands started. And basically, you can see that um, the way that this works, it allows you to set up a custom event name for <clears throat> each time this gets fired off. What Faraday does, in case anybody is not familiar with it, is it's basically a a set of middleware that is used for processing HTTP requests. So this payload is going to be all of the details of the request every time. And since Faraday is something that's used below other libraries a lot, it has this really nice convenience of allowing you to customize what the instrumentation name is going to be when it gets fired off. So maybe I'm using this in my 
foo library and I want it to be foo.request or something. Well, they've given me, they've put some thought into it and given me the flexibility to do that. Um, XCon, which is actually another library uh, which has to do with HTTP processing. processing. Um, this is the one that's underneath Fog, which is sort of the multi-cloud abstraction library. And what's kind of neat here is that um, you'll s you notice that they actually allow you to specify your own instrument or object. So if you don't like active support notifications, you don't even have to use it at all. All you need to do is pass an object with a dot instrument method on it. This is really, really handy for debugging because you can jump in a debugging console and like create a class that what instrument does is drop into another debugging console or something like that. And uh, it's really nice that that flexibility exists. And again, there's the option to customize the names of the events that XCon throws. So I think that's a really useful general pattern if you're a gem author or if you're using these gems to know, know how this stuff works. Because I mean, the alternative is a lot of, a lot of gems before this would have you know, debug mode or you turn on logging and it spits out logging to something. And this gives you a lot more control. So there's a couple of other projects that I just want to mention. One is Matthias Meyer's LogRage. Basically what this does is it customizes the logging that uh, Rails does by default. So if you turn it on in production mode, you go from this kind of big beefy multi-line log <coughs> into single one-line logs that are human readable but also really machine parsable. The problem with this is if you have a bunch of threads running at once, they just all get mashed and mangled and you can't tell which lines belong to which requests and it becomes pretty useless pretty fast. So if you look under the hood, basically what he does is he unsubscribes a bunch of the existing log subscribers and then he has some custom ones he resubscribes and it's all super elegant and simple. So it's a great example for how you can use this stuff. Um, another th another uh, project is Harness. And basically what this does is it ties into all of the events that Rails is already publishing, all the ones I already showed you for performance in information. It's backed by Redis. It stores all that stuff transiently, and then it will kick it off to different metric storage services. And again, the way that he kind of ties in the, the uh, subscription to the existing uh, stuff is really, really clean and really nice. So it's worth taking a look at. Um, finally. You know, if you're interested, especially in the events that Rails publishes itself or um, just seeing some interesting examples of how this stuff can be used, you can just go into Rails, you know, check it out, search for dot .instrument, and you can find all the places that they're using it. Um, and there's some pretty creative uses, so that's worth, worth checking out. Um, so that's pretty much the last thing I want to talk about. I think one thing that I've seen some kind of confusion around with this is it's kind of like, awesome, now we have events in our applications. We can use this all over the place. I think it's really important that you, because fundamentally what this is, is it's just you know, a pub sub system, right? So I think it's really important that you talk in your team when you start using this about where, where your subscribers are going to live, what kind of stuff you instrument, whether this is really for only instrumentation, whether you're going to do anything with application code. You know, so and I get questions like, oh, well, I want to kick off, you know, I already have background jobs that I kick off when a user signs up. Should I just fire an instrumentation event and then send them their, you know, welcome to our service email from a subscriber? So you kind of need to have conversations about that. My suggestion is that you think about limiting this only to the stuff that has to do with how your team is monitoring the system. The nice thing about that is it kind of gives you the ability to put all of the logic that has to do with treating client requests very clearly in the application. And you can have one-liners for the instrumentation that you're doing and handle all the instrumentation logic somewhere else and in a really clean way. So <clears throat> wrapping up here, I mean, basically what this is is it's a simple uh, message-based system. It's very flexible. Um, and I think there's a lot of bonus value there for people who are using it with Rails because Rails does already expose this stuff. But I also think it's super useful if you're not using Rails. Um, and they've really done a lot of work in, so this is available in any version of Rails since 3. So um, you know, this isn't something you have to be running on the very latest stuff to use. Um, but they've done a lot of work to really decouple pieces of a lot of these libraries. And it's really nice, I mean, this entire library is like 200 lines of code all of it. It's in three files. So, you know, it's very accessible, I think. Go check it out, read it, think about using it in your projects. And that's it. So, any any questions? Awesome. All right, thanks guys.